Uh, hi, everybody. Um, I'm name is Inding. I come from Huawei R&D USA. So I'm very glad to be here and to discuss some uh, multi-tenancy Kubernetes container. How do we do multi-tenancy Kubernetes cluster uh, in our uh, OpenStack deployment? So yeah, this, this one is not the advertisement. I have that for some reason. So you can see uh, Huawei have about more than 176,000 employees. So apparently we have a lot of internal development, development that's going on. So we are changing our all our internal platform into more agile and microservice based. So that really also our customer, external customer have the same thing requirements. They, uh, they want to move their practice into more agile. So that's why we need to uh, convert to the container world to work with all this uh, fast changing world. So now let's bring up the problem we want to solve. So now the, all the business logic is um, more breaking to the distributed environment. So now we all transforming to more agile and DevOps practice so people can turn around and try fail very fast. So now everybody, I mean, most of people are focusing on the container. Let's say use containers, but will that solve everything? Mm, so we have some questions we need to answer. So first, how should I orchestrate them and operate it, all these containers in a, an automated and reliable way? Uh, we can, uh, in our typical deployment, we can have easily uh, thousands of containers in hundreds of nodes. So that's a very legitimate question we need to answer before we can put it into our uh, production environment. Also, uh, how should I make them work with our current IT infrastructure? We have our uh, OpenStack production ready product called uh, Fusion Sphere. So we have, uh, I mean, a dozens and uh, hundreds of customers already using our cloud solution. So if we want to give them the solution, say use container based on our IT infrastructure. So we need to answer this question too. And the last one say, yeah, we have a networking storage. We have our OpenStack Nutrien, Cinder, even not OpenStack storage is there. So how should we this make this work if we try to adapt to containers? So we have to answer these questions before we can move to the container world. Uh, so we decide to pick up uh, Kubernetes as our container orchestration engine. So behind this, we have a, a few reasons. First, first uh, the Kubernetes have a nice plugin architecture. So this make the orchestration, orchestration and the scheduling more extensible. For example, uh, when we are assigned a new container task, so we want to assign to some node. So we need to think about uh, how do we take account where we should put these containers. So there's already a, a bunch of containers running in probably in some node. So we will think, do we uh, want to make it uh, with some other container work together because we, have, we want to make it efficient, we want uh, some affinity between this uh, task, uh, existing running task. Or we may say we want to uh, make it a uh, high availability, we want to anti-affinity, we put them in the different node in purposely. So that's we need to, uh, that's, Kubernetes help us to make it easier. Uh, they nicely support it. We can customer some plugins and make it high web, how few feel the high availability and the scaling. And also uh, Kubernetes support multiple container format at runtime. I will bring up that later because we make some changes to make a container more secure. So that's a very important feature to us. And also, Kubernetes with this plugin architecture, you can plug in a lot of uh, networking and storage support. 
the last one may not be the least, so they have an active, very active community. So if you have questions and they're making the change, uh, I mean, adapt to the new change, all the user requirements uh, really quick. So that's one of the reasons we pick Kubernetes. So in our mind, so this one is I brought up uh, about the Austin Summit. So we think about, okay, the OpenStack should work with our Kubernetes nicely. So from the left, you can see when you deploy, actually the OpenStack already uh, support this nicely. You can, we have a Magnum and Morano project. You can use either of this, try to deploy a, a Kubernetes cluster. And the Keystone is really nice component to work for you for the IAM two, uh, component. And uh, the container registry, we have a uh, open source project called Dockyard, but we, I, I didn't put a name here because uh, Docker, they tried to all brand, mar I mean, make the branding with anything Doc related. So we are changing the name. So I will bring it here when we find a new name. <laughs> so then, uh, you can see the storage. We can use Cinder networking with our current uh, open, OpenStack uh, pr uh, project, uh, the Fushi and the Cura. I think Fushi is integrated in the Cura right now. So it's the nice plugin. So it will be the bridge between the Kubernetes and the OpenStack. So uh, for the right-hand side, you can see we could use uh, some the OpenStack project, uh, the project to do the life management for the Kubernetes, like a Murano and the new one is the Dune is, I think we have a decent summit for this product. So if you are interested, you can go there. And you can see you go north, go up. So you can either use the native Kubernetes API or you have an a API gateway to integrate the Keystone to give your authentication authorization. So then you have your, uh, custom API to work with this. So this is our Huawei's uh, cloud container engine. So basically you can say, uh, you can see in the middle is the Kubernetes based container orchestration engine. It's, it's the key, uh, core component of this. So around this, we wrap out all our services in, even with some web app or something. And the name is Fusion Stage, and this one is working nicely with the Fusion Sphere, and that's our uh, IS, our uh, OpenStack-based IS product. So uh, let's see how this makes multi-tenancy works. So you can see uh, in the bottom, you can see that we have a cluster one to cluster n. Does have a few nodes in there? So that's a pod is the uh, Kubernetes. Uh, concept you already know. So let's see this. So in the V1, we say, okay, if you want to make a multiple tenant, so what we should do? You want to security, you found isolation. So I said, okay, that's easy. Let's make, um, you have a new content. Let's make a new cluster. So if I have uh, N tenant, let's make N Kubernetes cluster. Apparently this have problems, right? So it's not efficient. Every time you bring up, you need to uh, bring up a new, uh, uh, you need to bring up a separate cluster. You need to uh, uh, provision the cluster itself. It takes time. It's against uh, the, the goal. We want to use this uh, container because we want to fast deployment and we will turn up and turn down them very fast. So it's, but that's what we want. That's, uh, uh, this one work actually nicely for our public cloud customer because the people, the, the tenant is come, come, it won't go really fast. It's not our internal uh, dev environment. You, it's, you, you come and you go very frequently. It's not, it's uh, more like a stable tenant. So we just need to uh, scale up and scale down the uh, cluster size, the size of the cluster. So then uh, in the V2, we think, okay, can we mix the VM and the physical machines together? So that's one of the solution we are thinking about. So uh, initially we said, okay, let's make a separate, separate pools. So you have VM pools, you have 
a physical machine, the bare metal proofs, if you want to use VM, let's uh, get results from VM pool. If you want the uh, physical machine, let's get it from the physical machine proofs. So then you have the same idea. If you want a new uh, tenant, let's create a separate cluster for you. Then we think about, uh, why not we mix a VM and a uh, bare metal machine together? This, this, uh, we could uh, re eliminate some virtualization layer for some uh, very, uh, uh, for some uh, services we need efficient and we don't want to, uh, for user VM, also some business issues. One of our users, they don't have the uh, license for Oracle database running on the VM, so they can only run on the physical machine. We said, okay, can we make them, di make this work and make the mixed resource together for uh, one tenant, one cluster, and this one. Then we said, okay, now the question is, <coughs> do we have to have a separate cluster for each component, uh, tenant? So we think, can we have one big cluster? We already extend our orchestration engine support uh, more than the open source community. I believe it, when they support 1,000 nodes, we already support 5,000 nodes. So it's a huge cluster. So I mean, why can we um, take advantage of this and make multiple tenants live in the same cluster so you don't need tear down and the cluster every time? So, but you can see in the middle point, I point out maybe we have a security issue there, right? So people think about is the isolation using namespace C group is that enough? Is, does it provide enough isolation and does it, I mean, for the private cloud, some user doesn't care. They said, okay, it's just uh, some different uh, internal users. They, they are not required that much security. However, for our public cloud, you, uh, external customers say, okay, that's, it doesn't work. So people need to isolate it. Either you get, go back to the solution one, each tenant have their own cluster, or you give me another solution. So now we think, okay, we need some secure containers. You can see we are thinking about, uh, there's a two approach to do this. And we go in the one, so one solution is make your container extensible and uh, the other one is, uh, I think VMware have the same solution we as, uh, uh, the same as us. They say like make VM smaller and smaller, thinner and thinner and close to a container. This is one approach. So we work, I think Intel is working on the other direction, is make a container uh, growing up a little bit uh, to support uh, VTX and uh, hardware uh, uh, virtualization, take advantage of that. We, <coughs> we work with them with the lightweighted QMO, uh, QEMU and to make this work. So actually we, we still call it a micro VM because we are not I mean, we are trying to convert this micro VM as container together. However, from outside, you look like it's still kind of a, a VM, even because it's called QEMU, we try to make it more like a container. But the, from perso uh, performance perspective view, it's already very close to container. It take about, the first one, you just need about uh, 300 millisecond to bring up one micro VM and, and also we do the modif modification of our container OS with this uh, uh, QMO, modify the QMO solution in there so we can bring up a multiple container in the same micro VM. Now it's very close, uh, so with this uh, hardware, we leverage the hardware virtualization solutions so this, the container security is very close to the VM, and our goal is make as safe as the VM, so then we can claim, okay, that's a secure container. We don't need to worry about, we don't need to worry about this solution. We can put two container in the same node. That, that won't be a problem. 
So the, the, this uh, we use uh, uh, a network virtualization and also memory isolation uh, <coughs> kernel same page merging and we try to uh, make this working and also we make this work with uh, uh, ARM support. So not only you can run it uh, x86 uh, CPUs, you can work with the uh, ARM as well. Now let's see what's going on here. So now we bring it back to our first page and say, okay, I have an open stack. You have your container orchestration engine. Let's make this work together. And so you can see we have container from physical machines where you can have container with uh, virtual machines. And they all talk to the Keystone to do the authentication or authorization and go through the um, either native API or custom API, you can talk to the container orchestration engine. So to achieve the goal with the uh, tendency uh, verification and also with this, you want to pass all this information to Cinder, Neutron, all this uh, OpenStack, OpenStack components to make it working as a whole solution. So uh, let's see what's going on, what I mentioned in the uh, next few pages. So first, uh, this from the old uh, Kubernetes is uh, from 1.1 1 .1 release. <clears throat> when we try to match it, so we do, uh, f we discover a few things. So the authentication and authorization is running in the API server is, is part of a Kubernetes master. However, when we try to use this uh, curer to talk to Kubernetes, it's talk to the Kubelet. This is running in the meanings. So basically, this is a kind of broken token and key passing. So basically, uh, you authenticate, authenticate with Keystone from the Kubernetes, uh, the API server. However, this key is only leave in the API server, but when the, we use a Cura to talk to Cinder or Neutron, then we find out, okay, the, the token is gone, so you have to assign a uh, fixed super user role if you want to create a network or you create a volume. So it, it doesn't work at all. <clears throat> so we need to pass this access key, so to we then we say okay we need a plugin to say make this uh, access, key, uh, access key to pass to the Kubernetes so it connect ma uh, Kubernetes master and minions and also the role is different so in the Keystone we have the role user project I, uh, concept in the Kubernetes cluster you have a group user and namespace we say okay let's make the project um, namespace map to the project, the group map to the role, so we can make this role uh, working for the Kubernetes and uh, working for the OpenStack as well. Then we have the Kubernetes 1.3 release. Now the Keystone, the official Keystone still under development, but they release it. We find out, um, still something is broken. So uh, authentication, they connect authentication uh, with Keystone. The, this plugin make this works. However, there is still lack of uh, authorization. So how do we, we say, okay, this, uh, we, when we pick Kubernetes, they have the nice plugin mechanism. So we say, let's write our own. So we um, write our own ABAC author, author, uh, authorization plugin. So with this plugin, then we pass the access key to the Kubernetes, and we can make the uh, Cura have the key and they talk to uh, Neutron and Fushi with the, uh, uh, the key and we talk to Cinder. Also, the, there's a change, another change is say, okay, this the, the group, we don't need to change that. So you can see they, uh, in the Kubernetes, they have the, they introduced the role as well, so we can say, okay, it's a nice matching. We don't need to have this awkward group map to row. We can have the row to row. This concept converge together. So that's make perfect. 
then we said, OK, so we have the uh, Keystone authentication. Let's make this work with the other component of the uh, OpenStack. So you can see with Cura, we say, OK, let's make uh, Cura work with Neutron so then the Kubernetes can, uh, with your already authorized uh, a privilege to work with Neutron server, you can see uh, that's a two different deployment. On the left side is a physical host. Basically, you deploy uh, your, you want to have your containers running on the physical host. The, on the right side, basically, you have a VM running your physical host with a hypervisor running. <coughs> so this make a two different, so you can see uh, on the left side, it make more sense. The Neutron server talk to the OVS, you talk to the Ethernet in your, uh, uh, either zero or Ethernet in your, uh, you know, physical host. However, in the VM, so I use dot lines for there. So basically, uh, we have a nested OVS. Basically, you talk to Neutron, talk to the OVS in the uh, physical host. Then the, the host took the VM OVS. Then you talk to the container. That's uh, two layers. So we say, okay, that's not efficient. But it's working, it's just awkward. We, then we have a new solution say, okay, we don't need to talk to the OVS. Let's look at chunk pod. <coughs> we already uh, verify that it's working. We are do the final touch to make one, whenever it's ready, I will put it here. So we use the chunk pod to talk to the container so we don't have this uh, double OVS layers. It doesn't make sense. And also for the, uh, the story part, we have uh, Fushi, so basically uh, before that, let's go, before that you need uh, a uh, mount uh, volume to a host directory and then you, you need to mount your volume to a host directory then you to mount to the container, make it more like a stateful container. And with the cinder it's much easier, you just mount this volume to the host, then the container can use that directly. I can show the detail in the next couple of pages. So this, with this uh, solution, actually we uh, make this work even nicer with the VM I can live in the same, uh, the container live in the same uh, network with the VM. Pay attention to this VM. This is not, this user space VM. It's not the uh, VM, the OpenStack running. It's, it's not the management VM. So basically user can say, okay, I, I can have VM, I can have containers. Let's make it's mixed resource and work together. So you can see in here, we have VM1, VM2, and the container 1.2. They all live in the same network, the same network Neutron created. And this is uh, some detailed look for using Fushi work with the uh, storage. So before that, as I said, you need a host pass the volume mount to a file or directory. So you need that mount into the uh, file system to make this working. With the Fushi plugin, with the uh, authenticated role, you can say, okay, you simply mount this single wheel volume to a host, the Kubernetes. So the Kubernetes understand, so you can easily uh, use this mount to the, the, then the container can easily use this volume to make it a stateful, kind of stateful containers here. Cool. Yep. So that's uh, what I'm talking about. Uh, thank you, and I can answer some questions. It's over there, I believe. Hi, I'm Adam Young, Red Hat and Keystone Core. So I have some questions about the multi-tenancy aspect of, uh, of what you're uh, there. You, you showed the potential and you had that slide with the security um, issue, security access issue on it. And um, 
did you end up implementing this such that the resources that were used for the Kubernetes cluster came from multiple projects, not tenants, projects um, within Keystone? And if so, how did you resolve the security issues there? The second question has to do with that ABAC plugin that you had into Keystone. What were the attributes you needed to enforce on, and what is that access key that you're passing on? Uh, let's go back to the first one. So actually, we have this integrated already. So your question is, uh, uh, is this actually working in this page, right? No, how did you resolve the security issue? I assume you made it work. I was asking if you did actually do it. It sounds like you did. How did you resolve the security issue? Uh, this one, so the issue is uh, the next page I have a show. It's called a secure container. So basically, the container have the, uh, isol the very uh, it's the isolation or physical, uh, the, what I can say, the uh, isolation is it's more than the namespace and the C, C group isolation. Did you, did you uh, I, I, saw the, I saw all that. Did you make it so that a user could then not go into their um, corresponding project via the Novia APIs and access the virtual machines that those containers are running on directly? It's uh, this two layers. Uh, so this one, you can see this micro yeah. VM really running this one VM per, uh, one, one container per VM. Mm -hmm. So basically this, this kind of, this, uh, is a one container per micro VM. So this micro VM really fast is not like the old VM you need to, you can use the, uh, the Docker daemon, uh, the modified version of our Docker daemon to trigger this uh, micro does, VM. Does that VM show up as a resource within Nova? Uh, no. It does not. So it's running yeah. inside of a Nova VM or a bare metal deploy? You can do both. So it depends right. on how to deploy the, your... So those are resources that the, the Nova user uh, the, the, the end user has access to via Nova, and thus they could get access to and at least kill these, right? Uh, the uh, Nova, Nova can see the, the reg, uh, you can see on the left side, you can, can there's a one physical VM and also one VM. Yeah. You can kill that one. That right. one you can see. So if my... On the right-hand side, that VM, the external VM, Nova can control. Right. The internal micro VM, Nova don't have... But that means if your container is running in a VM that's, that's in my tenant. That, that my micro tenant. VM, it talks to the Docker daemon. So basically, it's in the uh, Kubernetes world. It's right. the Kubernetes master control that. So where do, who, how do you prevent backend access to the resources that, are, that the Kubernetes cluster is getting in so that I can't mess up your containers running in my VMs? So I'm sorry, I didn't get the discussion. Let's say you and I are both have projects that are contributing to the Kubernetes cluster, mm -hmm. right? And I have VMs that your containers are running on because Kubernetes placed them there, right? Uh, I, th I think you can think about this. We are converging this micro VM and container as a one an entity. It's yeah. more like the the container we are talking about. We call it. Right. So basically, so Kubernetes cluster can put multiple this micro VM or secure container in the same host, the Nova, Nova host or yeah. Nova VMs. So, right. so these two VMs can, these two container or two secure container, they have the isolation similar to two VMs running in, two v, uh, in one Nova host. But whose quota are those coming out of? Who, who owns those VMs? Uh, sorry, maybe I shouldn't use VM. Let's use a secure container. So basically, the secure container is controlled by the uh, Kubernetes cluster. But it still has to run on top of resources allocated from Nova, right? Yes, the Nova allocate the external VM, the actual VM. And so is there a rule that says my containers only go on my VMs? Uh, yeah, you can define it, basically. So you, uh, let's see, uh, this is two layers. Is, uh, one is called scheduling, one is a resource allocating, right? right. So if you alloc, you can see this, uh, with this solution, there's only one pool of the VMs, right? No one create about, I mean, for example, 100 VMs. That's sure. a VM pool. So then Kubernetes will see that, okay, we have, I have 100 nodes. 
So yeah. how do I allocate that one? That secure container is allocated by the uh, Kubernetes master. They decide which node we, I put this container on. So then why, why put them under multiple tenants? Why not have a Kubernetes cluster for each tenant and keep the isolation there? Yeah, what, you what mean, is why is... Uh, yeah, I mean, we've, we've, you've you just, don't mix the, I mean, right. I think your question is in the middle, nowhere, uh, node, right? Why I put two tenant container in one node, and, right? And how do you ensure that you don't have bleed over between two different paying customers or two different people who don't trust each other within the same Kubernetes clusters whose stuff should then run in two separate Yeah, the, the thing is we have only one cluster, but multiple tenants, that's our thing so we don't need to redeploy our control cluster i mean the kubernetes cluster each time so we only have that one live forever so if you have new content i say okay you have a new tenant you have a new tenant come so this you share the same amount of a resource why don't we skip to the second question which is the the app ABAC and what those those keys were oh uh, you mean that key we have uh, two Two keys are more like the AWS. You have your secure key and you have your access key, right? We pass down this access key with our plugin. We pass this access key from API, uh, API server to the Kubernetes. So Kubernetes uh, talk, uh, use this, talk to Cura, Cura use this to access, I mean, to talk to Neutron or Cinder. What, what are the attributes that it's... The, that the it's, access key, you mean... Yeah, where does that come from? What is the that? The AB, ABAC is the file system-based thing, right? So you put your rule in your config file. So basically, based on that rule, we do that. A, yeah, ABAC is a file system-based. So we put all the rules so and you know, all... An external database that people need to pull it on out of, specific to your deploy? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Hey, just a quick question. Um, you said that you made some uh, like patches to uh, like to QMU or like can, can you uh, maybe I missed that. Um, will you will you share some of that information? Or yeah, how, that how one will be open source. This is a joint work. It's us with the uh, Intel. So we are going to put that it's called uh, Cumulite or something. It will be open source. Okay. I believe. Thanks. Could you go to slide 15, please? Is that RBD, is that Ceph RBD intended to be Ceph RBD there? Where it says RDB? Uh, uh, it's RDB. So... Uh, it's, it's, it's not Ceph RBD? Uh, Actually, this, uh, I'm not sure. I, I need to talk to my peer to answer that clearly. Got it. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron.